When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Hackett. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. And he's nice enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the marketplace. So, Sean, how are you doing this morning? Doing good, Casey. Real good. There's a few things going on in the world you probably should take a take a little minute to talk about. We've got this uh, crisis that we see going on over in um, Israel and with Hamas and the whole situation we see there. Um, this This is not something that's uncommon when something like this happens, but... This is a little more of a uh, uh, iron fist coming down on top of, uh, of Hamas and the Gaza Strip right now. So I guess, Sean, as you take a look what's going on right now, when you start looking at how this is going to affect the commodity marketplace long term, what are your thoughts there? And are you anticipating something bigger than um, what we see happening right now? Well, you know, when this happened back in 1973, um you know, it set off a wild um, um, inflationary move in commodities in the short run, and it can maintain that inflationary environment all the way into the early 1980s, meaning that there was a long tail to the last time that we had this kind of an altercation between Hamas and Israel. Now, no two times are ever exactly the same. We have our Russia-Ukraine war to boot and other factors and China, you know, a lot of things that are different today, but nonetheless... It would, this kind of attack and this kind, the magnitude of this suggests that this is going to have a long tail to it. And, um, and uh, typically that means more upward pressure on commodity inflation than less over time. Doesn't mean today, doesn't mean tomorrow, doesn't mean next week necessarily, but you know, this is not going away. Having 1500 plus Israelis um, perish, um, that's just not something that's going to be resolved or uh, um, negotiated out anytime soon. And so we'll just have to see where this goes. But obviously the market, the commodity markets had fallen asleep on geopolitics, thinking nothing to worry about. And obviously now that risk is back on the table and it's an element that's going to be much more of a factor in 24 than it was in 23. And uh, we just have to be on guard for very quick, fast news headline kind of moves in markets like crude or natural gas or wheat or, you know, just markets that are in the crosshairs of potential supply constrictions. Remember, I have to remember the Middle East not only is obviously a dominant exporter of energy, but they're a dominant importer of food. So it gets interesting in a hurry if uh, if this starts to uh to kind of escalate in, in a chaotic uh, scenario. Um, so we'll have to just be on guard for how all these play out, but it, it definitely puts upside risks now on the table, uh, back on the table from geopolitics to go along with weather volatility and everything else that we talk about on your show. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird time. I don't know if it's just the, the news cycle or what, but I don't remember this many conflicts going on at the same time of this magnitude anyway. And you start looking at, you start taking a look at Africa, what's going on there, and how many of the African countries that were former French colonies that are, are in uproar right now. And, and you look at what's going on there with the coups and those kind of things you see, and that 
it just seems like there's a lot of a lot of friction in the world right now when you start looking at things in some key areas too we start looking at like um Niger and those kind of places where you start looking at oil and coming out of Africa and in the in the uh Ivory Coast and those areas where you start looking at cocoa and those kind of things, there's a lot of tension in those areas that can have a big impact on what we see happen. Well, it's kind of like when the old generation is still in power like they are now, but they're waning in their mm -hmm. age and power and influence, and the next generation is uh, displeased with how they're yeah. being treated by the older generation who wants to maintain money, power, and influence, you get the clash and that's what the 60s and 70s were all about was the the up-and-comers who are now the old geezers mm -hmm. um not liking what the current old geezers at that time were doing and so you get massive conflict massive coups geopolitical events everybody's angry at why their lot in life sucks and they believe it's your fault and how can we not doing something about it and because they're not doing something about it according to them they take violent action um and so we're in we're in that and um, it's uh, it's inflationary. Mm -hmm. It always has been, always will be, and it's it's a reason that these inflationary cycles trigger on a fairly regular basis because it's it's demographics. You know, it's always the case that the next generation up has different ideas, different views. They think uh, it matters. You know, if you put pesticides down on food now, when we were alive, we didn't really care. Um, not that we shouldn't have cared, by the way. We just didn't care. Okay, mm -hmm. so 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 we you know they live in the digital world. We were we meaning the older generation doesn't understand the digital world. So it's 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 just where we're at, and it means a lot of volatility in geopolitics and the economy and markets. A lot of confusion, a lot of capital that's going to be fired all over the place because it doesn't know how to handle this environment because the old rules that you follow aren't applying anymore. And, and markets are doing things that have been, that are unanticipated, unexpected. So you just have to keep your, your eyes open. Uh, you have to keep your, um, your biases at bay, meaning, you know, whatever you think, you know, and however smart you think you are about, and, and as, as grounded as you are in those beliefs based upon past historical precedent, they probably are going to have very little influence on what the next 10 years looks like. And so you have to be able to, to accept what you think you know and also accept what you don't. And the most important thing is watch what the markets are doing, not what you think they should be doing. Um, and that's really the key. The markets are the ultimate answer to everything. Are they moving up? Are they moving down? Are they moving sideways? What's going on in the markets? And regardless of what you think they should be doing, if they're doing something different, try to figure out what it is, what's driving it, and try to rebalance your biases from past historical precedent so that you can make better decisions going forward in whatever business you're in and trying to project the economy, prices of things, and that sort of thing. It's, it's really a time to you know, uh, be open-minded to a new way of thinking. And obviously with artificial intelligence, quantum computing that's growing exponentially, the rules are changing yeah. um, really rapidly. Are. And we really don't know what the new rules are, uh, but they're not going to be the same. And so, so just, just an example, you know, this Ozempic drug that it was approved back in 2017 for diabetes is now proven to be a massive uh, benefit to weight loss. So people could take Ozempic and they're losing 30 to 40 pounds in two to three months um, because it reduces your urge to eat, your addiction to eat, whatever you want to call it, you know, your craving to mm -hmm. eat. Um, and there's two other companies that have different products of, of similar, you know, so these, these, these weight loss drugs are coming out. And so now the big worry is, well, if 30% 40% of the U.S. take Ozempic and, and no longer have a craving to eat as much as they did before. What does that mean for chocolate demand? What does it mean right. for meat demand? You know, I, I, we don't know. We, right. we don't know, right? We, we, we don't know. But what I'm saying is that's a game, potential game rule changer that you have to keep your mind wide open to that if this drug, re these drugs really play out and people really start taking them and they are, and they are all proven to be safe, um, 
people ate less food. And uh, and then you look at well, if you're if, if you're more trim, if you're not as heavy, we know that much of health is based upon being overweight. I mean, our country back in the seventies, I think. 15, 10 to 15% of the people were considered overweight. Today, I think 65% of Americans are considered overweight. And we know that the health consequences of excess weight grow exponentially to health problems at an earlier age, whether it's cancer, whether it's diabetes, you go right down the list. So if this Ozempic craze makes put people fitter and, and have less weight and healthier, then they live longer. Yeah which improves some of the demographics we've been talking about that sure. are kind of negative. Yeah. And it also, draw, it also, <clears throat> we spend less money keeping people alive, meaning instead of, so, so maybe you still get cancer, mm -hmm. but you get it at 85 instead of 75 in the 10 years that you would have spent millions of dollars trying to keep yourself alive between 19, for, from age 75 to, to age 85. We're not spending money on that, on that person. And if we have 30 million Americans, I don't know, that are doing the same thing, the massive reduction in the layout for healthcare and Medicare and Medicaid is gargantuan. Yeah. And that also starts to solve some of our unfunded liabilities. I'm just throwing this out as one simple example of, of a potential game changer for forward thinking that we have to consider. No, it's not going to happen overnight. No, this isn't just going to like... But it's a, it's a trend that we need to follow and, and factor into our long-term projections and probabilistic views of what supply and demand will look like. And, and this is one of many things AI and quantum computing are, are going to present themselves into the future. And we just have to be open-minded to understanding how these are changed. Some, some demand will weaken and other demand, uh, demand for other things will go through the roof. It's not an all one, one for all thing. It just means a shifting yeah. Just, you know, and, and we just have to have to go with the flow. Yeah. So. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of crazy things happen right now that are, that are changing the way we do things. All right. You got a USDA report coming up here on the 12th. That should be Thursday. Right. Um, taking a look at what's going on there, Sean, any big surprises you think is going to come out of this, out of this report? You know, the short term reaction is always expectations versus what they say. Right. So we'll get all the analysts to come out and say, we expect whatever 175 corn. We you know, they'll come out with their estimates and either the number is above or below and the market trades that in the first hour or two. Um, and then we move on, right? I mean, that's that's what these markets are. My feeling is that the, the variability of crop results that I've seen across a wide swath of the Midwest are so variable. I just don't think the USDA is going to be able to make any dramatic claims up or down dramatically. Uh, from where they already are at, meaning we already know what the quarterly grain stocks numbers were. Corn was a little lower, so it's a little higher. So that's been traded. We, we, you know, that's traded, right? We traded the last USDA report, 173 and change, uh, corn yields and 50 and change. You know, so I think based upon the expectations the market currently has, I don't think when it's all said and done that the USDA is going to make. When we, when we get down to the ending stocks number, which is the only thing that really matters, they can raise the yield and increase demand and nothing changes, right? Um, I don't think they're going to materially change ending stocks that would warrant a dramatic move up or down in the grain markets right now. I just think the variability is too high, and I don't think, given their conservatism, that they're going to be comfortable or willing to make any major claims in this report. I think it could take at least until January, assuming the government's open, by the way, um, I, you know, at least until January before we may you know, get a clearer picture. And it may not even be by January. It could be even longer before we get a handle on a crop that's this variable in nature. Um, so I kind of feel like once we're through this report, we're kind of done with the USDA. We're moving on to South American weather and geopolitics. I think after this report, I really don't think current mm -hmm. USDA balance sheets are going to matter much at all. We'll watch, of course, we'll watch um, demand from terms of exports in China and that sort of thing. But in terms of Crop projections. I think this is the last report that really means anything, in my opinion. So, right on. It'll be interesting to watch that play out because, just like you said, the variability that I'm talking to guys about. There's some guys I talk to that it's the best crop they've ever had in their area, and there's guys I talk to that are um, 
it's the worst crop they've ever had. And, and, and that's not like it's a, you know, six, five states away having that conversation. It's literally on one side of the state versus the other side of the state. And it's, it's you know, 80 bushel you beans, know, you know, yeah. 20 bushel beans, yeah. uh, in, you know, in a, in a, in a geographic area that's not, like you said, not too far away. And I don't even yeah. know how you assimilate that. I don't yeah. think the USDA can we, we don't have enough information. We're what we, I don't, I haven't looked at the latest progress, but it was here 30, 35% harvest did something like that. I don't yeah. know. I mean, yeah, we're, it's, there's still a long ways to go. Yeah. There's no way they're going to make a major determination on this report, or at least they shouldn't. If they do, you know, they, they're free to do as they wish. Maybe they will, and, and the market reacts big, but there can be no justification to make any major changes, in my opinion, on this report based upon the variability. I just think they're going to punt the ball down the road and say, we'll take another look at it, um, assuming that we, the government's open. So. Right on. All right. So you've got a dairy report coming out here later this week um, that you're going to release. And the dairy market's been in just turmoil here this year. They've had a few high spots that have been um, uh, a nice, good places to be, but they're short lived. Sean, take a look at the dairy market. What are your thoughts there? You have to remember the dairy market is not one thing, it's many things. It's butter, it's cheese, it's powder, it's whey. Right. These are your four key components that produce your class three price and your class four price, which is the prices, two major prices that dairy farmers sell an amalgamation of those two to get their net milk check at the end of every month. Um, so when you look at all that, we have, we have record high prices for butter shortages. You know, the West production is very, very poor. And we're not producing enough butter. Our cold store stocks are very, very low. When you run the numbers into December, we're going to be excruciatingly low on butter inventories. We've seen milk powder, skim milk powder prices really take off in the last three uh, GDT auctions. These are cash auctions that are done internationally in New Zealand that measure the cash price globally for various uh, dairy components. So we've seen the milk powder price really take off mainly from a significant increase in Asian demand and especially Chinese demand. We've seen European milk powder prices taking off. So we're starting to get ourselves to where the demand for that product is exceeding the supply and we're starting to move higher. Dry whey prices are, are moving up strongly in the U.S. The U.S. is the number one exporter of whey to China. Whey is a key component to feeding piglets who are developing into uh, mature hogs that are then utilized obviously bring through the packing houses and slaughterhouses to make the pork in China. So obviously if they're going to rebuild their herd, the demand for whey has to go through the roof. The one problem area is cheese. We have plenty of cheese. We're not developing shortages. We're overproducing it still. And there's a couple of milk processing plants that are primarily going to produce more cheese. And so that's the market that's, that's part of the class three price. Um, that we need to still work through some of this excess supply. I think we will. I'm pretty comfortable that by the time we get to the end of the year, or let's say into the first quarter, we'll have done the job of kind of working through that. But that's why the class three price, Casey, has been underperforming the class four price, which is butter and powder. I mean, the class four price is, you know, closer, close to 20 bucks, whereas the class three price is closer to $17. Um, and so, but overall, typically class four leads class three, I'm optimistic 24 is going to be a better year uh, for the overall class four, class three price. And I think dairymen are going to have opportunities to sell prices that at least cover their costs and maybe put a few extra shekels into their farm equity. Right on. So let's talk a little bit about what you see happening in the cattle markets. The cattle markets have been getting beat up here pretty good. And they've had some rebounds here and there, but mostly they've, they've seen some, <clears throat> some tough, Tough runs, and you know we, you've hinted to that a little bit that you saw. Hey, this last quarter of the year, September, October, November, December time frame, to be ready for some some volatility in the cattle market as we compared to what we've seen. So I guess Sean, talk about that and what you see happening right now. Well, everyone thinks that that, that cattle is this, is this homogeneous. We always have cattle coming. It's very seasonal. Sometimes there's a lot more cattle coming to the market. Sometimes there's less. It's a lot. Of, there's a lot of seasonality to it based upon. Um, the reproductive cycle and the feeding cycle and that sort of thing. But we have a lot of cattle on feed that need to come to the market here in the fourth quarter. Um, when you look at the cash price, if you look at the uh, beef cutout price, the select and the choice, they've been falling now, Casey, for the last 45 days, I think it yep. is. Um, 
you know, we haven't seen a steady decline in the beef cutout price for over a year. Now, it doesn't, you know, it, you know, just because it's down, it's, it's declined doesn't mean that that is going to continue, but it's a sign that we finally reached a level that the uh, available supply for beef is exceeding the demand for that beef. Finally, as, at least here in the fourth quarter, let's put it that way, at least here in the fourth quarter. And so long as the beef price is weakening and the amount of cattle on feed that need to come to the market are healthy, the cattle price is going to be under pressure. It doesn't mean a crash. It doesn't mean, you know, it's all over, but it means that, you know, supply and demand are unfavorable here. And I don't really see how that's going to change the sticker shock, Casey, um, especially with the recent uh, round of interest rate increases we've seen and and some of the data that we're starting to get on the retail side and this consumer spending side. I mean, some pretty ugly consumer spending numbers are starting to come out. Yep. And um, and I don't care who you are. I know I, I always hear, you know, cattle demand is impervious. It's never going to. Yes, it is. It's, it, it, there's people going to say, I'm just not going to spend that much. Uh, I'm going to pull back my beef demand and it's starting to happen. It doesn't mean it's a permanent change. Remember supply for the next 12 months is going to be very, very tight. So this is not about some, uh, you know, somehow we're going to redo the reproductive cycle of the cattle industry. We're not, it, there's a physical component that it can't really change the supply overnight. Like it can in hogs, like it can in chickens and that sort of thing. So this is all about, what price has to modulate demand to keep demand rationing strong enough to buy that time for eventually that herd rebuilding cycle to lead to more cows and higher weights to come to the market and rebalance the market. So right now, the fate, which we're at is that there's too much supply relative to the demand. We're seeing that in cash price. Um, and I think we're going to, I think we're going to see that into the end of the year. And I would continue to follow the beef cutout price as, a, as, a, as an indicator for, you know, when price is getting too low, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we're starting to get demand back and starting to get a bounce again because that's just – it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep oscillating and be the governor of when it's to happen. But for right now, our view about a bearish fourth quarter and that producers needing to kind of protect themselves, we think, into the spring just to be on the safe side um, is starting to play out as being a good call. And we still think it's a good call. We would use any rallies that may occur here for cattle producers to protect downside price risks, lock in some cash, just make sure you 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 take some money home on the farm. We're in a very uncertain world with geopolitics, with the economy. Um, there's always a potential for rogue waves to come along, like we've seen with COVID and 08. And who knows if that's coming again. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But if it were to come again and all of a sudden we'd have the cattle price just collapsed for, for a little while and all of a sudden you're in a position of losing money selling cattle. You have no one to blame but yourself. Right. No one to blame. Yep. For sure. <clears throat> all right. Last thing, and we'll shut it down here. As you take a look at what's going on, you know, the, the Russia Ukraine thing, um, it, the UN's over there right now. They're talking about, you know, grain fertilizer exports and what that looks like. Russia is still sending stuff out, you know, but they're also starting to kind of pull back a little bit on, on some of their supplies. So I guess, Sean, looking at that particular topic, what are your thoughts there? And how do you feel? Is, is Russia coming up against the, hey, we're getting low on stocks. we got to have to take care of our people now. First of all, I think that this uh, expansion of war to Hamas, Iran backing, whatever, whatever's going on there with Israel, I think um, those out there that want to confront us see that now we're fighting two wars. We're involved in two wars now. We're going to fund two wars. We're going to supply two wars. And that means that the view of Russia or China or other terrorist uh, groups are that we are in a weakened and weakening position monetarily uh, and and from a from a a, a a military capability standpoint and you know just like any sporting match or any chess match you try to look for a moment of weakness to strike your opponent 
and gain economic advantage. And so I think this is a vulnerable time. So Russia is saying, hey, wait a minute, it, it, it was all about us, us, us. Now the U.S.'s diversion is diverted to something else. We may have an opportunity to flex our muscle and, and the U.S. may not be able to flex its muscle in the same way that it could have when it was solely focused on us. And China you know, may view the same thing. So this is a very uh, you know, vulnerable time, I think, if I'm Russia and I'm thinking about food and I'm thinking about the winter time coming and I'm thinking about energy and thinking about how I can apply maximum pressure to advance their goals, whatever those goals are, this is a time to be doing it. You know, I'm not advocating it, by the way. I'm a, I'm a peace guy. I want peace, love, and understanding for all. But thinking about, you know, these kind of leaders that have um, – that are doing what they're doing, you know, I'm, I'm thinking Russia is going to put the screws on the food side of the equation, the fertilizer side of the equation um, to create humanitarian pressure to move the ball forward in their favor. And as sad as that outcome is, that's what I think we're, where we're heading into. And so the answer to your question is they want to make sure they take care of their people at home, which means make sure they have plenty of food for themselves and they want to, deprive others of it to gain the economic and the military advantage. I might be wrong about that. I'm no, I have no degree in geopolitics and world affairs, and I'm not a secretary of state by any means, but that's my two cents worth of where I think we might be at and where, what I think could be some of the upside uh, price risks for energy and food is those, uh, Dark forces that are out there may view this escalation of war and the splitting of U.S. focus as an opportunity to uh, take advantage of a weakened giant. That's just my speculation. Makes a lot of sense. All right, Sean, appreciate you being on the podcast. Folks, I want to reach out to you and get more information about what it is that you're doing over at Hacker Financial. What's the best way to do that? Our Twitter page is at Faridex, F-E-R-I-D-E-X-11. We have a LinkedIn page. Of course, we have a website at Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors with an S, dot com, where we have interview, interviews and sometimes post some information about our cycles, our statistical work, our uh, correlation work that help make our weather forecasts and, and price forecasts to help bring more, more money home on the farm uh, operations. So, Right on, Sean. Appreciate you being on the podcast, man. Look forward to uh, Thursday's talk. Sounds good, Casey. Thanks. Right on, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast and go over to the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel, very cleverly named, so you guys can't, can't miss that one. Go to the uh, Moving Iron website, which is movingironllc.com. Go there for everything Moving Iron related. Have some big announcements coming up here before too long. Uh, you'll see some things come out. And also working on a new website, so there should be some new stuff there as well. Um, so with that, I'm Casey Seymour. We're Sean Hackett. Let's move some iron folks. Out. Moving higher in the 21st century.